Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to the Rally Point. Uh, you're with uh, Dominic Fielder, the author of the King's German series, and myself, Rob McLaren, the author of the Jobert series. Um, Hi, Dominic Fielder. How are you tonight? Uh, oh, fine, thank you, Rob. How are you? And, and hello, everybody who's joined us. So each month at the Rally Point, uh, we catch up with friends who enjoy the Napoleonic period. And and now, everyone, we're recording the first 30 minutes of the gathering. But once the recording is over, we remain online and the, with us and the conversation continues. And this month, we'd like to welcome Mr. Victor Paisa to the Rally Point. Uh, Victor is a... a Historical reenactor. He is also the uh, one of the presidents of the Napoleonic Historical Society, a president of Brigade Napoleon of North America. is based in Montreal. Hello, uh, hello, Victor. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. you look, I'm going to you describe you it as as a colossus of the reenacting world. Is that are you happy with that as as a starting point? Well, I, 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 I'm too humble to, to admit to that. Accept um, it. Just accept it. It's fine. All right. It, if you say so. When your slides are running, you can talk through some of the things you've seen in your long and distinguished, so far, not finished by any means, but a sort of a, a running brief up to date. And then also, I hear there's an interesting nickname for you as well. Yes. The spoon? Is that... Traditionally, traditionally in, in French units, at least for reenactors, for certain, um, we try and give an, a nom de guerre for each person. And that nom de guerre is either accurately portraying their characteristic or is the inverse. So you have somebody who's very tall, he could become tiny. If you have someone who's short, he, he could be coloss. Uh, in my case, when I started reenacting, um, I was the cook for our unit. So I was always by the fire with a spoon, either stirring a pot or tasting or trying to grab some of the food for myself before everyone else <laughs> demolished what, I, what I'd prepared. And so my nom de guerre became la cuillère, which is the spoon. And I, for the first few years, used to carry a large wooden spoon on the back of my backpack so people would recognize who I was. Um, as I got promoted and got more involved with organizing, I had no time left for cooking, but the name remained. Hey, see, to me, and I, th I think Rob probably feels the same way, this is the beauty when in writing of, of the reenacting world, because whatever we imagine, whatever we read in books, the moment you speak to somebody who's actually doing it, you get a whole extra dimension to the way that the Napoleonic world actually functions. Well, that's one of the things that reenactors or, or living historians try to bring to the study is that we test out the things we've read in books um, to see, is it possible to do what the, what the books claim they did um, and so on. Um, very often we find that the historical records are absolutely correct. You can live that way. Other times we discover that what's been passed down doesn't work. Um, for example, there are regulations, of course, for cavalry as to what you must have on your horse. Uh, a good friend of mine who was the head of light cavalry in Europe said, well, let's take my horse. We're going to load him up with everything that the regulation says he should have. I will mount up and let's see how it goes. So sure enough, he has a sickle, he has a bag of oats, he has his own gear and so on. He mounts up, horse will not go anywhere. <laughs> horse basically looks at him and says, you're an idiot if you expect me now to ride out. And the truth is that the colonels of each regiment would say, forget that, forget the regulations. I will tell you what you need to bring. 
the rest of the garbage you leave in a wagon. It'll eventually get to you, but you cannot go into battle loaded down. And that's you know one of the things that we can then give back to historians is saying, maybe that was passed down, but that's not the way it was. Yeah, there's there's the regulations and then there's field practice. Exactly. I suppose that's 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 the key thing. Um, I, I can't remember. There's a film I can. Uh, I'm sure it's a sort of World War Two film where uh, a new soldier joins a unit, and, and almost one of the first things the experienced um, soldier it might be Cross of Iron. Actually, I think there's a scene where he just gets rid of a whole load of his kits. You don't need any of that. You just need this, this, and this. And the thing we were chatting about beforehand was. Your, if there was a new reenactor coming to you, what advice would you give them? What What's some of the key bits of advice that you would say, from my years of campaigning, it's this? I would say, think very carefully of what regiment you want to portray and stick with that. If you spread yourself too thin and trying to do uh, cavalry, infantry, artillery, uh, different time periods, A, it will cost you a fortune in uniform and equipment because to be done properly, the saber that you got as an infantryman is not suitable for cavalry and vice versa. Uh, muskets that you carry change. Uh, the uniforms, of course, change. So you'll either spend a fortune equipping yourself. And secondly, the friends that you get will always be disappointed when you appear in different uniform than what they're expecting. Um, and, and politically, you don't want to make enemies. Um, one of the wonderful things about reenacting is you find friends from all over the world and you have to treat them well. And they expect the same treatment that they give to you back. So to show up in a different uniform suddenly is like betraying a friendship. That I would say is, is good advice. The other one is, Never go and equip yourself in a uniform without checking with the people in that regiment who can give you advice as to the best suppliers. There are all sorts of people out there who will sell you a bear skin. Uh, and if you don't order from the right person, you discover it's a prop. It was used in a movie. It doesn't look correct. It's the wrong type of wool. It's the wrong type of uh, uh, skin and so on. So we've had people who show up on the first day dressed and we said, you know, where did you get that uniform? Oh, I, I got it online through eBay. I got the whole thing for $800. And we are, well, that's really nice. You can wear it for Halloween, but it's not correct. <laughs> Look, while I'm looking, it, can you just show us the whole outfit? It, it looks oh. resplendent. So this would be campaign uniform. So just, uh, I don't know if you can see my pen. I'll tilt the camera down yeah. a bit. So it's just blue pantalon, long, yeah. long pants, um, white vest, the abi. And if I tilt it the other way, bearskin. You'll notice that the plume that I have is white with a red tip. For those of you who don't know, that signifies that I'm an aide de camp. Normally, a grenadier would just have a solid red plume. Um, but this is the uniform I'd wear on campaign. If I was um, required to be in full dress, instead of the white trousers, I would have a pair of white woolen, I guess in English you call them breeches, uh -huh. with white knee socks and buckle boots, buckle shoes rather. And that would be full dress uniform for a grenadier. This is a grenadier a pied. I also do grenadier a cheval. Again, I would suggest other people not to do both, but I did. Um, the only difference in the uniform would be in the bearskin. Grenadier a cheval, no plaque in the front and would have chin scales to hold it on, obviously, because riding on a horse, you don't want to lose the bearskin. Otherwise, um, the other little difference would be on the back. 
instead of having a grenade, you would have a cross, but the uniform remains the same. So it was an inexpensive way for me to do cavalry at the same time. May I ask that? Um, how, how, uh, while you're wearing the bearskin, first of all, how heavy is it? And how, how practical is it as a, as a piece of headdress? Right. It's, it's Clearly, the, the visualization is is to look fearful. Is you know look at these giant soldiers. Is it a was it a practical garment? Absolutely. In your, in your... If you can, I don't know if you can see the inside, but it's stiff yep. leather. Okay, it will yep. stop a saber strike. Uh, so there's right. protection there, like wearing a helmet. The fur of the bear is also waterproof and snowproof, so it makes a very practical hat. Um, it can hollow in the inside, so we can put a bottle of wine inside, we can have some eggs wrapped up in, in uh, a handkerchief that we can carry with us because we don't really have pockets. Um, so it's handy that way. Um, so there's, there's an added practicality. It is heavy, but you get used to wearing yeah. it. And okay. put on nice and tight on your forehead, you can actually look at the ground and not have it fall off. And as you say, it makes everyone look a foot and a half taller. You add another 12 inch to 15 inch plume on the top and you look like a giant. Um, yes. If we're inside like we are now, then I'd be wearing a decoy. Um, to, to step back a little bit, I started out, uh, as an infantryman, not in the Imperial Guard. People assume who, who have not really studied this period that all French uniforms are blue, all British uniforms are red and so on. And yes, line infantry is primarily blue, but the army and cavalry together, we cover every color of the rainbow. But I'll give you some examples of how uniforms change from where I started to where I ended up. So I started out as a fusilier, um, plain infantryman. The uniform looks similar to mine. You have slightly different design of the cuffs but basically red cuffs, blue jacket, white plastron. You'll notice the inside is just white, whereas Imperial Guard is crimson. Mm -hmm. From a distance, you might not notice. The same thing, the collar. I've got a blue collar. They would have a red one. They don't have the nice epaulets. They just have a button over, but it's practical. When I did well, um, I was promoted from fusilier to grenadier, but a grenadier of the line infantry. And unlike the nice bearskin that I wear as an imperial guard, I had a black goat, not a bearskin, but bonnet à poil, but from a distance, you wouldn't know. The plaque is just a big grenade as opposed to the eagle and so on. This one is much lighter than than my bearskin, but served the same purpose. Um, as a grenadier of the line, you would get red epaulets, um, but otherwise the uniform stayed the same. Um, if we talk about headdress, so little details. This bicorn has gold and red fringes, signifying that I'm a sergeant, or I was a sergeant, <laughs> and I wore it. Um, otherwise, it looks the same. Small red plume, very nice. You're promoted eventually to a lieutenant, and suddenly it's all gold on the fringes and the front and the back, and as an officer, a white plume instead of a red one. And if you continue 
being promoted and you eventually become a general of brigade, you get a decorn that looks like this. Black feathers signifying general of brigade. If you're promoted to a general of division, then they're white feathers. But basically, that's what you would wear. Um, <clears throat> so also the, the, the bling changes. Um, I decided in addition to doing the grenadier role to do Marin de la Garde. So I have a couple of examples here. Undress uniform for Marin de la Garde, quite simple, double breasted. I have here my rank as a Sergeant Major. So two right. chevrons there. A chevron on the left sleeve signifying 10 years of service. Uh, yes, yeah, so could ask my long service, yeah. 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 Otherwise, not very fancy, just a plain stripe down the leg, all in blue. All when you get to full dress for the Marin de la Garde, as a sergeant major, lots of bling. You have wonderful brass scale epaulets. You have red and gold embroidery on your vest, red and gold on your dolman. Again, the, the two gold chevrons designating Sergeant Major. And even the trousers quite decorative. Mm. And we take that a step further because I currently portray uh, what in English you would call a rear admiral. So contra amiral, then you get the Mining. of bling, lots of gold embroidery, nice big gold epaulets, and very fancy trousers. And, and that's how your uniforms change as you as you go up in rank. Makes it distinctive for us to know what rank people are just by sight. I've got a question that's coming for you, Victor, about the um, about the um, beacon for the mounted officers. Is there a chin strap with it? Yes. Or is it just, yes? Yes, there is a chin strap. Um, I did not bring any of mine with a chin strap, but just a plain leather right, okay. strap to hold it on. Absolutely. Just out of it. Did officers, want, I think the KGL inside there, uh, when they were, uh, because they had um, a skull cap inside them, a sort of a metal cap. Do officers ever have that? Just if you find yourself in a, you know, the wrong side of a saber jewel? No, there, there is a... It's just... Uh, it, there is a fabric lining to adjust for size to keep right. it, your head from going all the way to the top. So there is an airspace kept, but... Nothing else built That's in it. Yeah. to provide protection. So basically, get, get someone else to do the fighting for you on that. So when you're wearing that uniform, there. Although um, the the beacons are quite stiff, and unless you had a really good strike, uh, you probably would not go all the way through the double because you've got both the front and the back to go through to get to the person's head. So there is some protection there. Now, I, there's, there's something I'd like to know that's um, just when I'm reading about the French army, I'm, I've been reading about the French army in the sort of 17, 1792 to 1795. And that'd be an unfair to it. It all sounds, sounds at times like an army of rough sleepers. There's, there's an, when you're on campaign, how long is it taking you to prepare a camp? and strike camp what's what sort of time are you giving to that or what time what time are you given to that so if we're doing a real campaign event in other words we are going from village to village or through the woods when it becomes evening we basically find some place for shelter perhaps under a tree under a wagon um, in a pile of hay 
no time for tents, no tents are carried. We just live it on the ground. And each uh, platoon would basically divide up. One man would start preparing a fire, another man gathering wood, the others would scavenge for food, and one pot made, and we all share that for dinner. Dawn the next morning, all we do is make sure the fire is out, mount, put our backpacks on, and start marching again. So the only time we have tents are if we are staying in one place and, in essence, guarding a town or um, not moving. Otherwise, no tents. It start off with an infantryman. They basically have a plain sabre briquet, not very fancy. Oops, got it caught here. But basically just a short sword, a weapon of last defense, nothing fancy at all. As you go up in rank, and if you look at an Imperial Guard, so suddenly even the scabbard becomes a little fancier. The saber can be engraved. You have a nice decorative edge. The red cravat is to hide the blood that runs down your saber. Although as a reenactor, that usually isn't necessary, but it does it does add to the authenticity. And if you're then an officer, and if you're going to a ball or to full dress, instead of a saber like that, you would have an epee, so a straight straight sword. And in my case, as a um, contre amiral a very decorative belt, all embroidered with anchors and dolphins and so on. Um, if we talk about heavy cavalry, because I do grenadier a cheval, then you have a very long, heavy saber, like that. And basically, you would ride to the enemy straight arm through the first man you let let your arm drop he drops off the saber you bring it up and get the next one and last yeah i mean robbie that that tactic i think is was in the british infantry manual still in 1916 mm. that uh, that that method of fighting yes yes so as far as a uh, firepower most of you are probably familiar with a flintlock, uh, a straight flintlock, non-rifled barrel that the majority of the troops handle. But as uh, Marin de la Garde, the sergeants had rifles. So a rifled barrel, this is a oh, okay. rifle. Yeah. This is what we would have. And if you know the, uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, where Nelson was shot, he was shot by a Marin de la Garde in the crow's nest, firing a rifle like this one. Right. Okay, this, this was taken in uh, Jena in Germany, um, probably uh, 2009. And that's me as a grenadier on guard. This is in Borodino in Russia in the 200th anniversary in um, 2012. Uh, I'm sure you can recognize the gentleman who's leaning down to pull my ear, Mark Schneider portraying the Emperor Napoleon. If you notice, uh, if we go back one, you'll notice that it's a campaign uniform. So again, the blue trousers, um, yeah. off off-white gaiters, short gaiters underneath. Otherwise, it's basically the uniform I'm wearing now. But at that time, I was um, just a corporal. So you don't have as much bling, just plain red epaulets and not the gold ones that I wear now as a lieutenant. 
what is what pattern musket is that that you've got there? That would be a Charleville. That would be a plain yeah. Charleville musket. Uh, all all treize. Okay. Okay. This was also taken in in Germany. There I am in the in the second row. Um, I I think that was at. Um, Mind is blank, but um, not about Lutzen. This again was in in uh, Russia at uh, Borodino. So there you can see a good example of the standard Charleville musket that all of the troops, whether they're Imperial Guard or line infantry, <laughs> would carry. Uh, the only difference: Imperial Guard had um, more brass fittings, um, a little bit fancier wood, um, but basically the same design musket. Uh, this is uh, Honor Guard outside Montmirail. Um, that was probably at, uh, again, the 200th anniversary. Um, so that's the cenotaph there. There I am as a grenadier of the line. So you see, again, the plain <coughs> grenade on the plaque, uh, mm -hmm. plain red plume. The abbey looks almost the same, uh, except as the red collar and, of course, white inside instead of the, the red uh, and so on. You'll notice there's an arm next to me in light blue. So that actually was the sapper of the troisième ligne. And the sappers and drummers would wear the inverse colors so that they could be easily spotted by the officers in the smoke and uh, milling around of a battle. So they're always in more colorful dress to be quickly spotted. This is now um, in 2014 when we reenacted the march from Gulf Juan on the coast when Napoleon escaped from Elba and we marched to Grenoble. And there were um, 12 of us who did that. And this was taken in one of the little towns that we marched through. Uh, again, on that march, uh, you can see me there because it was March in the, in the Alps. I'm wearing my um, manteau, uh, just a plain double-breasted heavy blue wool coat. Um, the cross belt, one for my saber, the other for the gibelm, obviously carrying my, my uh, musket. And at that time, uh, Sergeant Major, so I have red and gold on the uh, tassels on my uh, bearskin, as opposed to the gold that I wear now. And there we are at... Uh, the historic meeting between the Imperial Guard and the Fifth of the Line, when Napoleon, in the movies, nicely anyway, said, if you want to shoot your emperor, le voici, here I am. That's what we were reenacting right there. So we're all in our great coats. Um, the majority of them, of course, did not do the march from the coast. They just arrived um, in time to do the battle. Or not the battle, but the meeting, rather. Uh, this is back in Borodino again. Um, we are guarding the emperor at the top of the hill, um, as was our, our uh, job to do, uh, always used as the last defense of the emperor. So he was loath to send us into battle, uh, which is one of the reasons why we have the nickname Les Grognards, the grumblers, because we hated to see the rest of the army being shot and torn apart when we thought we could make the difference by marching to join them. But we were required to stay as a reserve. Um, this is a reenactment in Anza, California, where we, because the terrain is very much like Spain, so this is somewhere in Spain. Um, again, you see 
put the back of a typical grenadier's uniform in campaign dress, so the, the blue trousers, um, and line infantrymen wearing the shackle beside me, and uh, about to bayonet two unfortunate British <laughs> soldiers. Again, the march from Gulf Juan uh, up to Grenoble. Um, there was a nice eagle there that we all posed. This was the group that basically marched. And this was probably at Waterloo, but I don't recall which year. Um, so I am actually, ah, so that would be 2015. The 200. Oh, the, the, the big one, yes. Yeah, yeah. I portrayed the uh, Garde Drapeau at that uh, event. <clears throat> Back to Grenadier of the Line. Uh, this took place in Bedford, uh, Pennsylvania. Again, somewhere in Germany uh, for American events. Obviously, there was no Napoleonic presence. But in order to uh, practice and uh, enjoy reenacting, some of our events have to be held here in North America. So as a reenactor and living historian, uh, I felt it was important to learn to fence. Uh, I learned to dance. So I do social events doing English country dancing uh, and French uh, quadrille. Um, and that's me without uh, my uniform jacket, of course, but fencing and enjoying stabbing my instructor. Um, there is a French festival in upstate New York uh, where they had a house that they hoped Napoleon would use if he was able to escape from St. Helena. Um, and every, one year I was chosen to uh, be on the cover of their advertisement. Um, so that's me as a Sergeant Major Marin de la Garde uh, in the parade. That they that they had there. Uh, in the background, you'll oh, see. Some, go back for a second. Yes. You see a couple of people with um, yellow and green plumes. That signifies their voltigeurs. So they were the light infantry of the line. Uh, this is now the anniversary of the Battle of Austerlitz, um, and. Napoleon presented me with uh, my Legion of Honor at that at that event, and that's what that that photo was taken. Again, I'm uh, in the uniform of Marin de la Garde, but wearing the shackle rather than the beacon. Uh, again, Sergeant Major Marin de la Garde aboard ship um, on the island of, or rather, outside the island of Elba. Wow. This was taken at Fontainebleau. We, um, when we were reenacting, we discovered that the Marin de la Garde actually had a, a depot there. And uh, if you could see the entire writing on the wall, that was the depot for the Marin de la Garde. Um, and as the eagle bearer, we thought it was a great place to, to pose for a picture. Again, wearing the shackle this time. Marin de la Garde firing my Versailles rifle. And you can see some British troops there on the end of the line. So, uh, yes. Yeah, this was Hello. actually combined operation. a practice of uh, accuracy with, with muskets. So we, we loaded live rounds with musket balls and did target practice, which is why you see an assortment of uniforms. Everyone who wanted to try their hand was able to bring their favorite firearm and uh, try their luck. Uh, this was taken uh, at the siege of San Juan in Puerto Rico. There were French sailors in the harbor when the British decided to attack. Um, so obviously they joined the Spaniards 
to fight the British off. And I was at that time um, a junior officer for the troops there. Uh, this was uh, at the Battle of Leipzig for the 200th anniversary. We had a worldwide reuni reunion of all people portraying Marin de la Garde. Um, we ended up with about 30 of our, of our members coming from all over the world to, to try and group uh, as many Marins together as we could. So we have some from the Czech Republic. Uh, I'm from Canada. The gentleman next to me is from France. We had people from Spain, um, from Germany, um, from uh, Poland. Um, I don't think anyone from South America came. Um, and, and two others from North America joined me. This is again in California. I'm wearing the uniform of a lieutenant of the Marin de la Garde. Um, you'll notice the three stripes on the trousers uh, would signify me as a lieutenant. I just asked, but look, with that picture, uh, Mark's asked a question. Sorry, Mark, yep. just go back one minute. Uh, Mark's asked a question about that. Um, what conventions or rules apply to reenactors wearing medals? I'll see you. So again, you have to have been presented the medal as a reenactor. Obviously, my Legion of Honor is not uh, <clears throat> from France. I would never wear it on a civilian outfit. Uh, but because it was presented to me by the emperor, which was traditionally the way it was done, uh, I'm entitled to wear it on my uniform at a reenactment, but never in public life, um, because obviously the design is the same as someone who's been awarded the Legion of Honor for good works in the modern day, and it would be uh, sacrilegious to pretend that I am somehow their equal. That pic image there looks like something out of a film set. It's a, it's a very, it's a very well, striking it, pose you have there. It's an interesting event because it's on private land. Um, <laughs> there are no spectators, so it is only reenactors who are there. They have built a fort, um, so we can attack the fort. If you have a sapper, he can use his axe to chop the door in. Uh, it's much more real for us. Uh, as opposed to having a scripted battle with spectators where we're required to follow the historical winner or loser. Here, it's a game of tactics. The battle lasts hours. If you're shot and killed, uh, you're out of action for a while. You leave the field. When enough of you have gathered off the field of battle, you can re-enter as a new unit and continue. So. It's fun for us. Brilliant. Well, that, that sounds fun. Um, this would have been uh, in Poland. Um, can't remember the name of the battle right now. Um, again, Marin de la Garde, in this case, uh, facing Prussians. Um, Russians. Yeah, a few Russians there as well. Yeah. Yes. I haven't got my glasses on, so everyone's a bit fuzzy. I do have one British uniform, and that is Royal Horse Artillery. Um, because in North America, the War of 1812 obviously had no French troops, if I want to participate in any of those reenactments, I chose to go as, uh, as a British uh, Royal Horse Artillery member. Uh, that's me as a grenadier a cheval. Um, again, you'll notice the uniform is almost identical to what I'm wearing today. The difference is uh, aiguillettes, and uh, which I think is the, the worst uniform element that was ever designed. That's the, the, the strings that go over the shoulder and under the arm. Mm. They tend to catch on everything. Um, not practical. They look splashy, but 
not the most practical thing to, to wear. Uh, you'll notice the bearskin has no front plaque. Um, and you can probably see that there is a bit of a chin scale um, chin strap holding my bearskin on. And again, uh, another picture. Um, you'll notice the boots for this one are right up to the knee, uh, heavy cavalry boots. Uh, in the background, you see a uh, French hussar of the 7e Regiment. Uh, so we were in Malay there. Well, is that an Ulan the other side of you? Is that, is that... No. Sorry, no. sorry. Um, that's that's a 7e Moussa. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Hussar is a cuirassier on the, the front yeah, of the Yeah, and there's probably a cuirassier on the other side of him, yes. <clears throat> and now because final photo. So final photo, this is me uh, outside Paris at the uh, Jubilee of uh, Malmaison um, in my full dress uniform as a contre-amiral. And again, very good. wearing high boots, which even on a board ship we would have worn. Uh, I'm going to say we're, we're nearly out of time and we have to dodge the question about how many uniforms you have. But we don't have time for that, but, well, which is a shocker. Uh, at the moment, I have 11 uniforms, uh, of which I only wear currently about four or five. Um, others are nostalgic. I just don't want to give them up, but I've been promoted, so I don't wear them. Uh, as far as the Conte Amiral, I would only wear that at major events where I'm working with the emperor as uh, part of his entourage. Otherwise, at smaller events, it serves no purpose. So I revert back to being a lieutenant, which gives me much more chance to be active on the field. Um, and then I have some uniforms that members of our group have retired and I have them for the next person who wants to join. Well, uh, before I hand you back to uh, Rob, what I, what I was going to say, look, thank you so much. To, as, as an author, and I think Rob will probably feel the same way, without uh, living historians, reenactors, we wouldn't have half the, the rich material that we have. We would just have books, and they wouldn't tell us the story. You've told us some fantastic stories. And I'm sure if we sat around a campfire, one or two more might come out, which are which are less printable, you know, this, this time in the morning slash evening, wherever we are in the world. Uh, thank you so much indeed. It's it's always a pleasure to to talk to people. Part of being a reenactor is the to provide education to the public. Um, and so we're we're happy when people ask us questions. And they could be about the uniform, they could be about the life. Uh, how we did things. Um, the best question, however, is do we re use real bullets at the reenactment? And my usual answer is, well, you weren't here yesterday. There were 18 more guys, but unfortunately after the battle, <laughs> but, you get uh, and people believe it. Indeed. It's a shocking thing. I'm, I'm going to R rudely interrupt our conversation to to end our recording um but we're going to stay online so thank you everyone and thank you victor for, for a fascinating insight uh now so please stay online uh till we continue our chat i'm going to wrap up this month's rally point thank you victor very much for joining us and thank you for inviting me it's been a pleasure um next time um why not join us here at the rally point next month where we're going to catch up with mr adrian goldsworthy he is a roman historian and, and an author of both a napoleonic series and a roman series fascinating gentleman three authors three authors in a pub you know there's a joke there i'm sure so simply contact dominic and i for your zoom invite and our details will be at the end of the video um share rally point with your friends so we can hear from them as well um, and all of our previous rally points are up on YouTube. So it's good morning from me 
and it's good night from him. Good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>